All right, let's get started here with number one. Uh, we've got to kind of figure out where all these guys lie, which really is I'm, I'm trying to see if you understand negative numbers, see if you understand fractions and how to compare fractions. Uh, so, of course, uh, increasing would mean we start at the smallest number, so that'd be the most negative, right? Farthest to the left of zero, farthest to the left uh, on the number on the number line. So, so we got negative three here. We got uh, negative seven thirds. That's a negative number. Here's another negative number. Okay, and then we'll have zero. Zero will be you know right there in the middle. Uh, so let's see. Uh, negative 3, negative 2.99, really close to each other. Let's look at negative 7 thirds. How big is that? Uh, well, if you take 7 divided by 3, then we're going to get uh, 2 and a third, right? 2 and a third. So the question is, how? which one of these is furthest to the left? Well, 2 and a third is certainly not going to be as far to the left as negative 3. So go with negative 3. Okay, and then what about 2 and a third and 2.99? Well, 2.99. 0.99 is certainly uh, going to be bigger than, uh, well, bigger in magnitude, farther away from zero than a third. So we'll go negative 2.99 and then negative 7 thirds. Thought I had enough room. Okay, so we've got the negatives and we've got to zero. Um, so we've got all those guys. Now we have positive numbers. I'm going to keep myself from getting distracted by those. So 5 fourths, 3 ninths, 8 fifths. You know, let's just do this the, uh, I don't know, the most straightforward way possible. Let's get common denominators. Why not? Just, uh, just to mention it. So what would be the common denominator of 4, 9, and 5? We need to make sure that we have all the factors of 4, all the factors of 9, and all the factors of 5 in this common denominator. Unfortunately, these don't share any factors, so we need two factors of 2, two factors of 3, and a factor of 5. Right? So we essentially need, say, 20 times 9. So that would be 180, right? Be our common denominator of 180. So this one is going to be uh, 4 times uh, 45. Okay, so we're going to do 5 times 45. Uh, 5 times 45 is 225. So we got 225 over 180. All right, this guy's going to be uh, 9 times. Uh, 20, so we're going to do 3 times 20, so this is going to be 60 over 180. Alright, this one's going to be 9 times 4, that's going to be uh, 36. And so 36 times 8 is going to be the numerator. 288 over 180. And now we can compare these, let's see, 60 certainly is the smallest. Uh, 225 followed by 288, so 3 ninths. Let's see, 2 20 minutes, 5 fourths, and 8 fifths. All right. So we find common denominators, as uh, I believe someone said in, in at least one of the Algebra 2 classes, uh, we make them comparable. You have to be able to compare them to each other. They can't be comparable until they are the same size, and they are the same size when you find a common denominator. All right, so uh, you buy 2.5 pounds of hamburger at 560 per pound. We could look at this as a conversion, like if you're going to convert uh, inches to miles or, or anything like that. We could convert 2.5 pounds into dollars, right? Because what we do is we multiply this by, well, we want to cancel out pounds in the denominator and leave ourselves with dollars. Do we have a conversion between dollars and pounds? In this case, we do. In this case, at this store, for this hamburger, $5.60 is equal to one pound of hamburger. Right, so we cancel out the, the pounds. We're left with dollars. Uh, 2.5 times 5.6. Fourteen dollars. All right. Yeah, certainly, we don't have to do it that way. We don't have to convert it like we would inches to miles or whatever. Uh, if you buy two and a half pounds and every pound is five sixty, then you would multiply the number of dollars or the, the cost per pound times however many pounds you bought. All right. 
hourly earning rate if you earn $64 working eight hours. Right, so uh, what are you making per hour? Uh, when we want to create rates, we just want to figure out what, what is uh, you know, what is the per? Per what? Per hour. So we want to go per hour. We're going to go eight hours in the denominator. $64 in the numerator. These uh, cancel each other out, so we get $8 per one hour. So there we go. $8 per hour is your earning rate. When we say rate, where did it go? Rate. This is a fraction. It is a unit for every some other unit. Eight dollars for every one hour. Uh, you know, five x's for every or go y. Five y's for every three x's. Okay. Um, we get into rates. We get into slope. We get into uh, different rates have different names, like the rate um, miles per hour. We can call that speed. Um, and let's see. Try to sit here and try to think of a bunch of different ones, but um, we talk about rate, we talk about slope, um, we talk about speed, we talk about a lot of different things. Um, all right, so next, evaluate the power of negative five to the fourth. Okay, keep in mind we've got parentheses here. Okay, so the parentheses are raised to a power. What does a power mean? It means we're going to multiply this many of these together. So we're going to take negative five and multiply it by itself four times. Let's see what that makes. Well, let's see. First, let's decide if it's positive or negative. Let's get negative times negative. That's positive. Times a negative times a negative. That's another positive. So positive times positive is positive. So I didn't expect you to put a plus sign here, but just showing you my mental process here. Uh, 5 times 5 is 25. 5 times 5 is 25. 25 times 25, uh, I believe, is 625. We, could, we, we know that this is going to be a positive number, so we could just do 5 to the 4th power and find out what that is. It is 625. So there we go, 625, positive 625. So we evaluate this when z equals negative 2. I've said this just means plug negative 2 in for z. Okay, so 33 minus negative 2. This is the, uh, the bit that I'm trying to see if you remember to do. Negative 2 also times negative 2. That's what z is. Uh, we're going to add 3. So now this is going to equal uh, 33 minus negative 2 minus a negative is plus. So 33 plus 2 is 35 over negative 2 times negative 2. Negative times negative is positive. So we get a 4 plus 3. So that's 35 over 7. 7 does divide 35. So we get 5. Evaluate this guy when a is negative 2 again, and hopefully I'm assuming you can uh, Realize that this means the same evaluate means the same thing here as it does up here. Just put negative 2 in for a Okay, so 4 I'm gonna grab a different color uh, there we go. So 4 Times negative 2 when you're evaluating when you're plugging a number in for a variable It's a really great idea to use parentheses so that you keep things straight so uh, every a could just be replaced by parentheses. So a to the third uh, plus five times a, which is negative two, and that whole thing is now squared. So we're not going to square until we take care of what's in here in the parentheses, of course. Uh, first, before we multiply four times negative two, we're going to respect the uh, the exponent. Right? The exponent does not apply to the four. Uh, so we wouldn't want to multiply the four by the negative two. Otherwise, the negative or the uh, I'm sorry, the exponent of three would interact with the four, which is not what uh, whoever wrote this down wanted to happen. Okay. So first we do negative two, negative two to the third. Let's just kind of put a little note up here what that means. You're multiplying negative two times itself three times. The result should be negative because negative times negative is positive. Times another negative would make the whole thing negative. So we're gonna have four times a negative number. Two times two is four. Times two is eight. So we get negative eight. Okay, 5 times negative 2, uh, that's inside the parentheses. We do want to do this first before we raise it to the exponent. You can see kind of why I would include this question. Do you get that you only apply the 3 to the negative 2 here, but then you do multiply 5 times negative 2 and then raise it to the second power in this case? Uh, well, we have negative 10 then squared. That's going to be negative 10 times negative 10. So this is going to be 4 times negative 8. That's going to be negative 32. 
Uh, and then when we add this, we have negative, two, negative 10 times negative 10. That's positive 100. 100 minus 32 is 68. Going to distribute and collect like terms. That's what this is meaning by simplify. Right? Hopefully, we remember distrib distribution, the distributive property. Uh, six times x is six x minus six times three is eighteen. Right? If you don't multiply the three by the six, then what are these parentheses even doing here? You know, this whole parentheses needs to get multiplied by six. If we knew what x was, we would do whatever that is minus three, and then we'd multiply by six. But since we don't. We're going to multiply the 6 by the x and the 6 by the negative 3. Okay, because they both need to get 6 times bigger. Uh, minus, same thing here. 2x times x is, uh, negative 2x times x is negative 2x squared. Keep in mind this is a negative 2x, so this negative 2x is distributed to this positive 2. So it's going to be minus 4x. All right, so we're going to collect like terms. I like to do that for the, the highest power of x first and then moving my way down. So I get negative 2x squared, all right, because there's no other like terms with that. That one's taken care of, all right? This is a negative 4x. This is a positive 6x, so we have a total of positive 2x. Those are taken care of, and we have a negative 18. We're done. All right, we're going to solve. Um, if, so I'm going to give you some advice. If you have not already uh, taken this advice before now, if nobody told you this or you didn't listen to them, uh, I really hope you listen to me now. Okay? Uh, you may be able to look at this equation and just kind of reason out what R has to be. And that's great. I mean, th that's fantastic. You can see what R should be, but it just can't go that way forever. Okay. So if all through algebra you told yourself, yeah, I won't listen when they say do this to both sides, I don't need to do that. I can just see it, okay? That skill could get you through algebra, I think, okay? But algebra 2, um, pre-calculus, calculus, all of the other maths that are uh, tied into algebra in some way, uh, it's not going to work. You cannot just look at these equations and figure out what x or r or whatever the letter has to be, okay? To give you an example, if I gave you 2x squared plus 3x minus 15 equals uh, 2,800, uh, you're not going to be able to figure out what this number is. You'll never figure that out just by looking at this equation, okay? It takes uh, being able to manipulate both sides of the equation and thinking algebraically, logically, and um, and getting there step by step, all right? Uh, one piece at a time. It is not as easy as this guy. I know this is simple. You can just look at it and say, well, R's got to be whatever. But it, it's not as simple as that forever. And it starts with forcing yourself to do the thing that seems kind of silly, and uh, if it seems kind of silly to you. So that would be to start with like subtracting 5 from both sides, all right? Negative R over 10 equals 7, okay, and taking it, like I said, taking it step by step, step by step. So what do we now do now? We're going we're gonna to try and, let's say, cancel out the negative, right? Let's make this into a positive. So we can multiply this by negative 1. You multiply by negative 1. You, uh, you know, switch the sign. So now we have positive r over 10 equals negative 7. Okay, now we want to cancel out this 10. Okay, we talked about uh, multiplying by fractions. So if we multiply straight across, now we'll find that we can cancel those 10s. So we multiply this by 10, so we get r is equal to negative 70. Now you may have been able to figure out that I want to add 5 to something and get 12, which means this is going to have to be, and you kind of think about it, this is going to have to be 7, right? Okay, so that has to be 7. Uh, but it's negative, so then r is going to have to be negative so that the negative times the negative will be positive. Okay, so this needs to be 7. When I divide it by 10, it needs to be 7, so that needs to be 70, but it needs to be negative, so negative 70, right? But it just doesn't work in a case like this and so many other cases. 
right? Even when we just throw some fractions in a simple looking equation like this, it, it gets to the point where it's just too hard to, to just think it out, right? So um, if you can, uh, you really should give that up. Uh, the, just thinking that you can just look at any equation and figure out x, it doesn't last forever. It, in fact, doesn't last very long at all in Algebra 2 that you're able to do that, okay? So start now. Subtract 5 for both sides, add 2 to both sides, whatever it takes. Just do it one slow step at a time, and it will make doing these so much easier in the future. All right, enough of that, me babbling. Uh, solve the equation, this thing, okay? So we got to get all the x's together, you know this from algebra, on one side, uh, and then uh, get x, just one x on, on a, uh, one side by itself, and then you, you know what x is. All right, so first we need to get at this x, but it's inside this parentheses, so we're going to have to distribute this 3. All right, let me grab another color. We got 12 minus 9x equals negative 4. Okay, so now we're going to distribute this negative 1. You know, this is really a negative 1 into this parentheses. So negative 1 times 8 is negative 8. Negative 1 times negative x is positive x. Okay, now what do we do? Well, we want to have all the x's on one side together, okay, rather than on two different sides. So I will add 9x to both sides. Uh, so we have 12 equals, well, let's just put these together. This is going to be negative 12 plus 10x, all right? Uh, so now we're going to add 12 to both sides, getting x closer and closer to being by itself. We have 24 equals 10x. We divide by 10 on both sides, we get x is 2.4. All right, so, I mean, even just this equation, it's not a very complicated equation. Fairly simple things going on, adding, subtracting, multiplying, that's it. Uh, but to sit there and think about it to figure out that x has to be 2.4 here and here, it's just, it's a, it's a bit too much to just mess around with, to guess and check. Okay, guess and check is a good way to start, right? It's a good way to start when you've never seen this equation before, you have no idea where to start. Guess and check is great, but you have to get past that to uh, a process, all right? A logical process that you can follow every time. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Okay, so we're gonna get into this more uh, in, in future lessons. But the thing that I want you to know about graphs is they are not shapes that certain equations have, okay? They're just a way of keeping track of all the solutions to that, to, to that equation, this equation here. This equation, which is essentially y equals 1 fifth x plus 3. Remember we talked about functions in class. You can put anything you want here, and something will come out here, right? anything you want. You can put anything you want in there. If you are asked to graph something and you have absolutely no idea what the graph is supposed to look like, that shouldn't matter. It's nice to learn shortcuts and, and it's nice to learn this should look like a line when we graph it, and another one should look like a parabola, and another one should look like circles, and another one should look like this or that. But um, that's when, when you don't see the connection between uh, an equation and a graph, more than this is the shape it's supposed to have, it can make it a lot harder. You put something in for x, you get something out for y. So put anything you want in for x and find out what comes out for y. That's what you're supposed to do, okay? So put something in for x, let's just say one, okay? Put in one for x, so we get one fifth plus three. That's going to tell us what y is, right? We're just gonna add these together. This is going to be, we get common denominator here, so we're going to get 15 fifths. So y is 16 fifths. Yeah, I don't really like that fraction. Let's figure out what to do about that. But let's also think, um, you know, what connection is there between this graph, uh, this equation, and the fact that when you put it on one, you get out of 16 fifths. It's just a way of keeping track of the solutions. I can put them on this chart, or I can put them on this graph. Here we have the x-axis, okay? So we have our input of one. What do we get when we put an input of one? We get 16 fifths. Here's five fifths. And here is, um, yeah, here's five fifths and uh, 10 fifths and 15 fifths and 16 fifths. Okay, 
okay, no, I don't, I don't like graphing that. That's, it's inaccurate, it's not very good. I would like to, my, my numbers that I graph to be like right on these dots somewhere, okay? So what can we do about that? Well, what if we put in something for x that somehow eliminated the fraction, right? So how about if we put in 1 fifth times some number that doesn't give us a fraction to add to 3. What number could that be? Well, what if we do 5 over 1? Well, 1 fifth times 5 over 1 is just 5 divided by 5. It's just 1. That's nice. Now y equals uh, 4. So now we plugged in something whole for x. We got out something whole for y. And now we have something that's really easy to plot. 5 comma 4. Imagine if we just plugged in 2 and 3 and 4. You may know this is supposed to be a line, so you can connect these to be a line. All of those y values, there, 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 they would be not very fun to graph. Another easy thing to do in, in this case would be to eliminate it by using a 0. And so y equals 1 fifth times 0 plus 3. y equals 0 plus 3. y equals 3. So you plug in a 0, you get 3. There's your, you may remember, y-intercept. Okay, so then we grab uh, our line tool. We draw our line from here to there. I th oh, it's this guy right here. We draw our line from here to there and out this direction too. Okay. Now without having to know anything about y-intercepts or slopes, I noticed that my three points that I found are in a straight line I can make a pretty safe assumption that this is a straight line. Okay, um, we'll learn more about that uh, in the days to come. But without knowing anything about what this graph should look like, I discovered what it looks like by graphing enough points. Right, and by drawing a line, all I'm doing is guessing at where all the other points are going to land. I'm guessing that all the points that I could possibly put in would land somewhere on this line, and in fact would make the shape of this line if I plotted all those points. All right, moving on, moving on. Hey, that should have stayed. That's very odd. Hmm. Okay, well, let's get rid of those then. If we're gonna be uncooperative. Um, that's hard to see. So the amount of water in a bathtub can be modeled by this function where t is the time in minutes and w of t the amount of water left in the tub. So this is a, a function notation. Uh, water is, the amount of water is the output. The input is the amount of time. That's all this really tells you. It's not w times t. You don't take the, num the amount of time and multiply it by the amount of water, okay? This is just saying the amount of water is what you can figure out if you know the amount of time that's gone by, okay? So if I plug in something for t, then whatever I get over here, that is the amount of water that I get uh, after I plug in a given t. Right? When I plug in something for t, I'm really plugging it in here, and I'm not multiplying it by w, I'm just putting it into the function. Okay? So what is the value of w of 4, and what does it represent? So w of 4, that just means I'm going to put 4 into the function and see what comes out. The, over here, mathematically, this doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean multiplication. It doesn't mean anything like that. It just means I put 4 into the function. So we have 80 minus 5 times 4. That's 80 minus 20. That's 60. Okay, so what's w of 4? It's 60. What does it represent? Well, um, what did I do? I put in 4 for t. What is t? Uh, it's uh, time. Okay, it's uh, time in minutes. Okay. So let's just say at four minutes, okay? Something happened at four minutes. What happened at four minutes? Uh, well, the amount of water in a bathtub can be modeled by a function of where, where t is the time of minutes. So, so at four minutes, there is, or there are, there are 60 gallons. grammatically correct. Okay, domain and range. Do you remember that? Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. If not, that's all right. We'll, we'll spend a little more time on that than we would say on fractions. Okay, so the domain. 
that would be all of the inputs. Right? Everything that you can possibly put into the function that makes sense. Okay. So let's see, can can this what's what's going on with this? Can this scenario go on forever? Um well, if we're not sure, let's take a look here. Let's put in five. Let's see what happens with five. Let's see what happens to the number of gallons. 80 minus five times five. Excuse me. Uh, 80 minus 25. So that's 55. So what's happening as time goes on, as, as t gets bigger, the number of gallons decreases. So can the number of gallons decrease forever? Mm, well, no. Uh, it gets down to zero gallons and then it's done. It can't go negative gallons, right? So we need to figure out when will we get down to zero gallons, okay? Um, maybe that we should bring that to the range. What is the range of this function? Well, that would be not all the things you can put in, but all the things you can get out of this function. What do you get out? You get out gallons. So what's a reasonable range for the number of gallons? We could have as few as zero gallons, okay? That's as far down as we could go. We could let w of t be somewhere in between. And what's the most gallons we could have? Well, it would be the number of gallons we have when we start. That would be when we put in zero. If we put zero in here, we'll have 80 gallons. So somewhere between zero and 80 is reasonable. Uh, what about the domain? How many, basically how long will this take? t would have to be between something between zero, right, no time has gone by, to how much time it will go by before we have no gallons left, okay? And we could keep plugging numbers in for t until we get to zero gallons, but you can see that 80 minus, well, this would have to be 80. So uh, that's simple enough. This would have to be then 16, right? So only 16 minutes can go by before the tub is empty and the number of hours uh, makes any sense. If 17 hours goes by, in reality, uh, this tub just has been empty for 17 minutes. Um, but if we plug uh, 17 into this function, we'll get a negative number. That doesn't make any sense. So we just kind of stop paying attention to the function after 16 minutes. Okay, so that's what it's asking for. What makes sense in this scenario? <coughs> All right. so tell whether the function is linear. Okay, if a function is linear, I'm just going to make it simple, then it can, make, it, can, it can look like this. It can be written this way. Can this be written this way? No, we need a fourth power here. I can't write it as, when, I, when it's mx, that's it's under, understood to be m times x to the first. Okay? I can't write this without writing x to the fourth, which means I can't write it like this, which means it's not linear. Then evaluate the function when x equals negative 3. Again, that just means plug in negative 3 for x. Okay, So f of negative 3, that's, that's how we would write that. That's what we're doing. We're evaluating it for negative 3. 2 times negative 3 to the fourth minus 7. This means nothing except for that we're plugging in negative 3. That's all this tells us. So 2 times, okay, we can kind of do this in our heads maybe. We're going to have negative 3 times itself four times. That should tell us that that's going to be positive, right? A negative number times a negative is positive, times another negative times another negative, that's positive as well. Uh, 3 to the 4th, let's see, 81 minus 7. 2 times 81, 162 minus 7 equals 155. Find the slope of the line passing through the two points. Okay, just really briefly. Maybe you remember this. Maybe you don't. We'll develop it more uh, later. But we take y two minus y one, so negative nine minus negative four, or negative four times or negative four minus negative nine. It won't matter. Just as long as we go in the same order. So we use negative nine first. So in the denominator, we'll use negative seven first. Negative seven minus nine. So negative nine plus four. That's negative five. Negative 7 minus 9, that's negative 16, so 5 sixteenths. That's the slope of this line. Do you remember that about lines? Maybe yes, maybe no. We'll, we'll definitely cover that. Uh, find the slope of this line, okay? Yes, there is a, quote, formula for uh, the slope of the line, but there's also another definition. 
we can call it the rise over the run. How much vertically do we go? And then after we go uh, vertically, then how far do we go horizontally, right? So if I start at this point or this point, I can start at either one, I'll show you that. So we'll go up one, two, three, right? Because that's that puts me at the same vertical as this guy here. So I go positive three, up three. How do I? How far do I go ver uh, horizontally? But well, I need to go to the left, so that's going to be negative. So I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, negative seven, or negative three sevenths. Even if I start at the other point, I go now. I go down vertically, so the vertical is negative this time, and to the right. 7, negative 3 sevenths. So same thing, doesn't matter, negative 3 sevenths is our slope. Okay. Line 1 contains or goes through the point 2, negative 5 and 6, negative 2. Line 2 contains these two points. Uh, are the lines parallel, perpendicular, or neither? Okay. So are they parallel? What does parallel mean? Well, two lines are parallel if they never touch. What does that mean as far as their slopes go? If this one has this slope, this line better have the same slope. If it had a different slope, if it were steeper than this line, then that would be a bigger slope and they would intersect each other. If this line had a, a smaller slope, that would mean that it's not as steep as this line. This line's steeper than this line. So that if we go this way, they would meet somewhere over here. So they gotta have the same slope. All right. Uh, if they're perpendicular, if you remember, great. If you don't, that's fine. If they're perpendicular, that means that they have opposite reciprocal slopes, uh, which means one is positive, one is negative, and one is the reciprocal of the other. So let's we have to find slopes. That's what it comes down to. So let's do this one in green. Find that slope. So negative 2 minus negative 5 over uh, 6 minus 2. It's negative 2 plus 5. That's going to be 3. 6 minus 2, that's going to be 4 3 fourths. All right, so if this other line is uh, a slope of 3 fourths, then it's parallel. If it's uh, negative 4 thirds, then it's perpendicular. And if it's not either of those, then it's not parallel or perpendicular. It's not either one of those. They will definitely touch. At some point, they'll intersect, but they're not perpendicular. Um, so let's find out which of those it is. Negative 7 minus negative 3. over 1 minus negative 2. So negative 7 plus 3 is negative 4. And 1 plus 2 is 3. 3 fourths, negative 4 thirds. What did we say? That was perpendicular. Because right, they have opposite reciprocal slopes. This was positive 3 fourths, this was negative 4 thirds. Okay. Um, which line is steeper? What does steeper mean? Let's let's look at two lines, one of them steeper than the other. Okay, well, let's say that we pick a like the same amount of horizontal. Okay, I'll even like take this and I will duplicate it. Is there a duplicate on here? Uh, yeah, so I'll just come right here. Right. I'll choose the same horizontal. Okay. Let's just pretend that horizontal is 1. Like the, the run is 1. Rise over run, we'll pick a run of 1. Okay, let's look at the vertical then. For a steeper line, we have a nice big vertical compared to this tiny little vertical, right? All things being equal on the horizontal, uh, the vertical would be bigger, right? So we have this uh, big versus small rise. This is a big rise, and this has a small rise. Okay, so you have rise over run, rise over run. This one's steeper. This one's not as steep. So how do their slopes compare? This is a bigger slope. This number will be bigger. This number will be smaller. Okay, so it comes down to if we remember y equals mx plus b. These are the slopes. Uh, which slope is bigger? I don't know. This is five six, and this is eight nine. They're uncomparable. So I need to make them have the same denominator. Same thing I would do if I wanted to add them together. So what's our common denominator? Let's see, uh, 6 and 9, we got uh, 36. They both go into 36. So I'll multiply this by 6. So we got uh, 30 over 36. Ooh, boy. This one I would multiply by 4. So I'll multiply this by 4. We got 24. No, 32. Excuse me. 32. 
over 36. So this number is just barely bigger, just uh, 2 36 bigger than this, which means this would be a steeper line. Okay, again, I say I have no idea about this guy. I don't know what the graph is supposed to look like, um, but I can input things and output things and keep track of those and then connect those dots. That's what a graph is, okay? A graph is really all of the inputs and outputs, all of the dots that you could possibly make, but we don't have enough time. That would be an infinite amount of time to draw all of them. So let's plug in stuff for x and get out some y's. And let's use our past experience to pick the easiest x's. What's the easiest x? Of course, 0 is the easiest, because anything times 0 is 0. So if I plug in 0 there, let's just do the work in case you want to see it. 4 fifths times 0 minus 2. This is 0 minus 2. This is minus 2, negative 2. So I put in 0, I get negative 2. Great. All right. Now, y equals negative 4 fifths times something else that is an easy choice. Um, and keep in mind, I want to put in a whole number, right? It's going to be over 1. Do I want to put in 2 over 1? No, I'm going to have something over 5. I want to put in 3 over 1, 4 over 1. No, 5 over 1, though. Now, this would be 20 over 5, and 20 is divisible by 5. Or you can look at this cross-canceling. Those 5s cancel each other out. 5 divided by 5 is 1. We have a negative 4. Okay, so negative 4 minus 2 is negative 6. So what do we put in? We put in 5. We got out negative 6. All right. Let's try and uh, boy. Can do that. Sometimes these lines disappear when stuff gets changed. Um, that should still be there. And it was OK. Um, I was going to change the color, but I'll forget about it. Um, let's do one more. We'll do three points. Here's another easy one. Uh, y equals negative 4 fifths times something that's simple, uh, minus 2. Something that would be simple would just be something that's divisible by 5, right? As long as I can cross-cancel this 5 with whatever that is. How about 10? How about 20? How about 50? How about negative 5? How about negative 10? Anything, right? So we see how we move over in steps horizontally of 5. Okay, might uh, sound familiar to you. That's how we would graph this using the slope. We move over 5 every time. Uh, rise over run. So 5's cancel. This leaves a 2, so now we have negative 8 minus 2. So this is negative 10 when we put in. What did we put? 10. Hmm, interesting. Um, so here we go. Let's plot some points. Um, let's plot this one. 0, negative 2. You might remember that being called the y-intercept. 5, negative 6. So we come over to 5. We come down negative 6. Let's see what that looks like. Five down six, right, and ten negative ten. So we come out to ten, and we go down to negative ten. That's easy. It's right there, right. And again, if I had no idea about what this graph was supposed to look like, it certainly looks like it's becoming a line. It could be this curvy thing that goes through all this just by uh, coincidence, but it certainly doesn't seem very likely. It seems like a line goes through those. And if your life depended on it and you wanted to be really sure, but you really weren't quite sure what it's supposed to look like, you could just plot more points, and it would more, look more and more and more and more like a line, and you could be more and more sure that it is a line. Yeah. So we graph the linear equation. You know, we could still do this. We could still put in anything we want for x, but we'll see what happens when we do that. Let's just say we plug in something for x. So let's put in, uh, well, certainly let's put in 0 for x, right? 5 times 0, uh, minus 4y equals negative 20. So now negative 4y by itself equals negative 20. So y equals positive 5. So now we can keep track of this over here. Um, we put in 0, and we got out 5. All right, let's do it again. Let's plug in 5 times. Hmm, now what's my guess for do something uh, 2? Let's put in 2. OK. Um, Negative 20. Okay, so we got 10 here, minus 4y, equals negative 
equals negative 20. What do we, how do we figure out what the output is? Well, we have to solve for y. Okay, so negative 4y, we're going to subtract 10 from both sides, so we're going to get negative 30, we're going to get uh, divide by negative 4 on both sides, get y equals 30 over 4, well 30 is not divisible by 4, but they are both divisible by 2, so we got 15 over 2, 15 halves, that's not so great. But if we put in 2, we got out uh, 15 over 2. Um, so a couple of different ideas, but here's the most simple one. Let's rewrite this equation so that for one, we don't have to do all the work of solving for y every time, right? We had to solve for y here, we had to solve for y here. Let's just solve for y once when we leave x in the mix, and then you know it'll be easier to just plug in things for x. Okay, so let's do that. We'll subtract 5x on both sides. So we've got negative 4y equals negative 5x minus 20. Now we're going to divide on both sides by negative 4. We did that here, we did that here, we're doing that here, y equals, okay, so we have to divide both of these things by negative 4, so now we get positive 5 fourths times x plus 5. Now we can see that the things that we want to plug in for x are things that are divisible by 4, right? So we'll do that once and then we'll be done, and we'll graph. y equals 5 fourths times, let's say, 4, plus 5. 4 is cancel, we get 5 plus 5, y equals 10. So we plugged in just now 4, we got out 10. Uh, can't quite go that far, so it's going to be alright. Um, let's see, 0, 5. We got that guy there. 2 and 15 halves. Um, that is going to be, what, uh, 7 and a half. So we kind of have to go off the charts here. Here's eight, here's seven and a half, that's two and seven and a half. So we're kind of getting way off here. Maybe we should go back, we should go to negative four. All right, negative four, so uh, we use this guy again, y equals five fourths times negative four over one plus five. Y equals these cancel, what do I get? Five times negative one, so I get negative five plus five, that's zero, so I got zero. Negative 4, 0. There we go. Now that's back inside the graph that we were given, inside the, the xy plane. Oops. Let me try that again. Give that a shot. Yeah, that was pretty good. Okay. So there we go. Any more on this page? No. Okay. Last two. Here we go. x equals 4. This is kind of a tricky one. How will x equal 4? But this graph will be all of the points where x equals 4. Okay, let's find one place where x equals 4 right here. The mistake a lot of people make is uh, if they recognize that this is supposed to be a, either a vertical or a horizontal line, that's usually what happens. They think, well, it's one of those. Well, how do I draw this? Just draw a graph that has x is equal to 4. No matter where you go on the, the, the graph, the shape that you draw, x has to be equal to 4. So here, x is 4. Where else, else on this whole thing is x equal to 4? Is x equal to 4 at this place? No. Here? No. Here? No. The only place where x is equal to 4 is all along here. Any point here will have an x of 4. Okay, so we just graph a graph where all of the points have an x that's 4. It doesn't matter what y is. y apparently doesn't have anything to do with this equation. It doesn't affect this equation. Uh, this is just x is 4. All right, so. Just a quick little, quick little quiz there, I guess. That's what I was trying to accomplish. Do you remember that? Does that make sense to you? Um, tell whether the function is linear. Again, I said before, real simple, cut to the chase. If you can write your equation like this, then it's linear. We can think of f of x as y. y equals 3x plus 4. That looks exactly like mx plus b. So yes, it is linear. Okay. Um, next circle it is linear. When x equals 5, What's the function worth? f of 5. We're plugging 5 into this function. 3 times 5 plus 4, 15 plus 4, 19. And we're done. Okay? So uh, thanks for watching. I really appreciate that. Uh, if you have any questions beyond what we went over here, uh, ask them, please, please, please. And uh, if, if there's anything that's a, a little more complicated, like, like this guy here. Of course, we're going to go over linear equations in Algebra 2. 
Uh, we're going to talk about slope. We're going to talk about y-intercept. But we're going to talk about them in the way that I talked about them here. You know, they, they just follow from what a function is. They don't follow from you being told what to do. Okay? I don't want you to fight that. You, know, you don't want to be told what to do in other parts of your life. So I'm not going to tell you what to do in math. I want you to think for yourself. Okay? And I'll help you do that. I'll help you connect the dots. But I want there to be dots and I want them to be connected. I don't want you to just be told this is a line, this is how you draw it. That's very boring. Okay? So anyway, that's that. Thanks for watching. Uh, I look forward to seeing you next time.